may be seated and if you would turn in your Bibles to Psalms 78, Psalms chapter 78. My subject this morning, tell the children, tell the children, how do we perpetuate this great salvation that we have been given? How do we pass it on? How do we perpetuate the blessing of Pentecost and the healing mighty miracles that we see in the church? And how do we pass these things on to our children? You know, God is a generational God. And how we live our lives, it will affect the next generation. And if we live a godly life, a life filled with the power of the Holy Ghost, we will have some stories, some stories to pass on to our children, which brings me to my text. Psalm 78, beginning in verse 1. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the word of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings or hidden things of old, which we have heard and known. And look at this. And our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generations to come the praises of the Lord and his strength, and his wonderful works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. God says, you are to teach these things that I've done in your midst to your children. Why are we to teach them? Look at Psalm 78 and 6, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they may see their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Look at that last verse there. Why should we teach our children about our God? Why should we tell them the stories? Why should we tell stories about what God has done to our little children? The word says that they may set their hope in God and not forget the work of God, but keep his commandments. We've got some stories, and we need to tell the stories of how God has blessed us individually. Amen. My subject this morning, tell the children. Brother, would you come and bless this message, please? Hallelujah. Many times I, I pray, but sometimes the Lord just speaks to me and says, Hey, Brother Philip, pray. Father God, thank you today for your presence. We know you're here. We feel it. Lord, we pray that you would bless and anoint this message, our pastor. Give him the words to say that we need to hear. We pray that you would bless and open our hearts that we'll be open and receptive to what he says and to what you say to us through him, and that you would bless this service, be glorified in it, be high and lifted up, be magnified in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Brother Philip. You know, in my text, God is speaking to the nation of Israel, and God said, I will show you lessons and stories from your history which have been handed down from former generations. And I want you to tell these stories to your children. I want you to tell them so your children will know what your God has done. Tell them so they can tell their children and keep passing these stories down from generation to generation. We are commanded in the text that I read to tell stories to our children to tell them about the goodness of God, the mercy of God, and, and they're to grow up in an atmosphere where they see the miracle working power of God. We got some stories to tell. And as you continue to read Psalms 78, God gives these stories that they were to rehearse and the stories that they would tell their children in the next generation and their children to tell the next generation. He said, I want you to tell how God brought you out of bondage how he opened the Red Sea and made a way for you when there was no way. I want you to tell your children how God sent manna 
when you were in the wilderness and you had nothing to eat. I want you to tell them how when you were thirsty, you struck a rock and water gushed out of that rock. And by the way, that rock represents Christ Jesus, hallelujah, the living water. And he said, I want you to tell them how God led you by day, by a cloud and by a pillar of fire at night. God said, you are to tell your children these stories about my miracle working power. Now, to us, these are Bible stories. But you've got to understand something that's very, very important this morning. To the children of Israel, these were more than Bible stories. This was their family history. That's why I'm, I'm reading the book of Chronicles. I just finished it. Hallelujah. One begot this one, one begot that one, another one begot this one, another one begot one. I said, just keep on reading, Jerry. Just keep on laboring through it. You'll find Jesus in there somewhere. Amen. Hallelujah. But these were family stories. These were things that had happened in their families. Mighty miracles that God had done for the children of Israel. And so what God is really saying is this. I want you to tell how God worked out your redemption and how you're to tell it to the next generation. God redeemed us, them, but God sent his own son to redeem us. They put the blood over the doorpost, and the death angel saw that blood, and he had to pass over. But our Passover lamb has been slain, and the blood has been applied to our heart. Hallelujah. And Paul got so excited about it, he said, Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. God says, I, I want you to tell the generations to come how I worked out your redemption. Tell them how you got to where you are. Church, we've all got some stories to tell. You've heard some of them this morning. There's a story to tell about why you are sitting in church this morning. That's a story that you have to tell about how you got saved and how you're in a Pentecostal spirit-filled church because God led you. God wanted to empower you. And God wanted to use you. And God wanted you to tell the next generation, your children, but he wants you to tell the world. That's the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Tell the stories. Hallelujah. See, it's not an accident that you're in the house of God this morning, that you're in a spirit-filled church where the blessings of God are, where God's blessings can flow into your life, and you can get your miracle. Hallelujah. This place is full with miracles, filled with miracles, and it's not an accident you're here today because God has been faithful throughout all the generations, bringing all things to this point. And to this moment, you know, there are moments, there are seasons in God, but there are moments when God changes you, touches you, and radically changes your life forever. You need to tell your children where you were and how you got saved. You have a story to tell, and God commands us to tell the children. You need to tell them what songs were being sung. When you walked into that church, how you were lost, how you knew you were without God and you were on your way to a devil's hell. And all of a sudden, when they got to singing and the preacher got to preaching, something got a hold of you and God's conviction power filled your heart and filled your life. And the next thing you knew, you found yourself down at an altar. I was a preacher's dream when I went to church. I'd prayed all night long and that. That man preached and never gave an altar call. I mean, I'm a preacher's dream sitting there. I, I had went right to the next to the front row, sat beside my mother and my daddy. And he did not give an altar call. I stood up. I said, I come to get saved. I'm not leaving this place without Jesus. God told me to go there. I said, I was like the blind man. But I got some stories to tell. He said, I want you to go to the pool of Siloam. And God said, I want you to go to this particular church. I went past a lot of good churches, but that was my day. And when I went to that altar and prayed, I stood up. I want a bit more born again in the man in the moon. 
And my mother said, son, do you have a testimony? I said, yes, I do. I told God I was sorry for the way I lived my life. I knew better. I asked Jesus to come into my heart, forgive me of my sins, and, and, and cleanse me from all sin. I said, I believe you had. When I said that, I'm saved. The power of God hit me, and my world was radically changed forever. Hallelujah. Tell your children. You need to tell them how the tears begin to flow down your cheek. How you found yourself in an altar of grace, crying out to God to save you. You need to tell them how God forgave you of your sins and wrote your name in the Lamb's book of life. You need to tell them how you became a brand new creature in Christ. While old things passed away and how all things became new. See, men, we live in a generation where our children need to know about our God. They're not going to get it in the secular school system today. They will get it in the home. That's where people say, oh, they took prayer out of the school. Well, they didn't take it out of my home. So they took the Bible out of school. Let me tell you something. They didn't take it out of my home. They took the Ten Commandments out. They didn't take them out of my home, and they can't take them out of my heart. I was taught as a little child. I, some, one man said I had a drug problem. I was drugged to church. Amen. I knew when Sunday morning came, I was going to church. I knew when Sunday night came, I was going back to church. I knew when Wednesday night came, I was going to church. It wasn't an issue that we debated in the family. My daddy, Bailey Nelson, he said, we're going to church. When revivals came, guess what? We were going to revival. That's the atmosphere I grew up in. And, and I can remember my daddy's testimony. He was a, a good Baptist. God bless the Baptist. He was reared in a Baptist church. And his brother, he was a Baptist preacher. Uncle Erky was saved, but my daddy wasn't. But my mother carried my daddy to a Pentecostal, spirit-filled church, full of the Holy Ghost and the fire of God. Daddy said something got a hold of him. <laughs> Let me know what I'm talking about. Something got a hold of him. And he was gloriously and wonderfully saved, and he was sanctified, and he was filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. Daddy would testify, and I could hear him now in my mindset, and he would testify and say, I'm saved, I'm sanctified, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, and it always add and fire. And he was, hallelujah. You know, I, when, when I go back to my home church that I was brought up in, young men would come up to me, and girls, and, and people would tell me, the reason I'm sitting in church today is because of your daddy. Your daddy influenced me by the life he lived. I'm in church today because of your daddy. I got cousins. They say, I love Uncle Bailey because Uncle Bailey, he was in there through the thick and through the thin, and, and he lived a godlike life. He was a deacon in the church. He was a song leader. He played his guitar. He sang his music for the Lord. He was a Sunday school teacher. He was a great Bible teacher. He was a student of the Word of God. Something got a hold of him, and guess what? Something got a hold of me. Hallelujah. When, when they preached my daddy's funeral, the preacher said, Brother Bailey Nelson held every position in the church that a man could hold except for that of the preacher. Now, Mother was the preacher. She didn't preach from the pulpit, but let me tell you, Mother was the preacher. Mother would read my mail when I was in high school. She said, Son, the Holy Ghost told me this about you. Mother, how could mother know? I thought it was all hidden. But there was an all-seeing eye from heaven. My mother was filled with the Spirit. You got any, any testimonies out there where mother and, and daddy knew what you were doing? And mother would tell me, son, don't do that. The Holy Ghost showed me. My mother said, the Holy Ghost showed me. I knew it was time for this old boy to change his ways. Yes, mother, I understand. But see... My parents left me something. My daddy didn't leave me a million dollars, but he left me a godly heritage because he had some stories to tell. Daddy had some stories, and I grew up. One winter, I remember when we were small children, we ran out of coal, and, and we didn't have any heat. And Daddy got down on his knees, walked out to the coal shed, and talked to the Lord. He didn't have the money to order any coal. He didn't talk to man about it. 
He talked to his God. And, and shortly after that, we were in the house, and it was cold. You remember those old linoleum rugs that the, the, the houses weren't underpinned? They'd blow up and down like that. Well, that's, I grew up with that. And, and a man came from Faulkner Coal Yard, and he knocked on the front door, and he said, Mr. Nelson? said, uh, I was over here delivering coal in the neighborhood. I finished all my deliveries, and I've got some extra coal on my truck. I don't want to take it back to the coal yard. Could you use it? What a mighty God we serve. We had no coal. I think that's ironic, you know, because later my daddy would become the owner of a heating and an air conditioning business. Hallelujah. But God supplied that need. We got some stories to tell Daddy knew that if God could spread a table in the wilderness and take care of his children as they were wandering to the promised land, that God could take care of us. I remember an occasion when Daddy was sick, and we had some son company come over one evening, and Daddy said, you'll have to excuse me. I've got to go to my room and pray. He said, I'll be back as soon as God heals me. That's faith. He was gone about 15 minutes. He came back in there. He said, the Lord has healed me. And now, you know, he joined the conversation and had, had the meeting. He never had that sickness again as long as he lived. The Bible says His affliction shall not rise again the second time. When God heals you, you can count on it. Tell the children. Tell the next generation. Tell them about your God. I, I thought about my mother. You know, I grew up out of poverty, not in poverty, but out of poverty. You got to get up before you can get out. I said, you got to get up before you can get out. But God brought, brought us out. I can still hear my mother praying. Lord, get us out of this place. Lord, help us. Lord, bless us so we can get our family out of here. You got something so much better than this for us, Lord. And God moved us from the cotton mill hill down around the corner from the man that owned the mill. <laughs> what a God. What a powerful God. From cotton mill hill, we lived around the corner from Mr. Cooper that owned the mill. That's a powerful God. It took some time. It took some work. But God got us out. God got us there. Hallelujah. That's why I told my children, I said, I don't want you Growing up, taking all these nice things that God has given us for granted. I want you to know who God is. I would tell them about Jesus. I wanted them to know what, what it was to be saved, what it was to be sanctified, what it was to be filled with the mighty power of God. I wanted them to know about a, a God who was able to do supernatural things who could take the natural laws and override them and give you a million-dollar miracle if you would cry out and only believe. we got to tell our children about the power of God. Say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I know God is able. He is able to do anything. When man has done everything man can do, and they say there's no hope, there's hope in God. He that is joined to the living is better than a dead lion. Even a dead dog. Hallelujah. I, I'm, I'm glad that, that I'm joined to the living. And as long as there's breath in my body, I'm going to believe God for his supernatural power. We've got to tell the stories, church. We've got to carry our children to church. We've got to train them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And if we do, God has promised that when they are old, they shall not depart from the faith. All of my children, I, I would ask my wife, I said, why do my children, why don't they just say, Daddy, I, I believe what you taught me, and I'm going to serve your God. And then I had a bright light come on. I said, why didn't I do that? <laughs> I didn't. And my children didn't either. And maybe yours haven't. But I'll tell you one thing. The word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the binding of son of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God knew what I intended. 
I, I can remember in combat saying, God, if you just let me see the sun come up, I'll serve you when, when I get home. I'll serve you and my whole family. I didn't even have a family. But God looked on my heart, and God knew, and God was so gracious to me. We got some stories to tell. In Exodus chapter 16, when Israel was in the wilderness, they had no food, but God supernaturally fed them. Think about it, an empty cupboard. We don't think like that here in America. This nation is, has so much abundance in it, but they didn't have anything to eat. And God sent them manna from heaven. And God commanded Moses to take some of that manna. He said, I want you to put it in a pot. And he told him, I want you to place that pot in the tabernacle in the ark. And it's to be kept for generations to come. And he said, when the little children come and gather around that pot, when they ask, Mama, Daddy, what does that pot in the tabernacle mean? God said, then you to tell them. How God provided for you when you were in the wilderness. Have you ever been there? Has there ever been a time in your life when, when you just didn't have it and you didn't know how you were going to make it? But God commanded them to tell those stories. In other words, God says com he commands us to tell our children how he has provided for us. Tell them. You see this nice house, kids? It wasn't always that way. Tell them, that was a time when I struggled. That was a time when I didn't have a job. That was a time when I didn't have a dime. And I didn't know where I was going to get my next dime from either. But Jehovah Jireh, the God that I tithe to, the God that I serve, the God that I love, the God that I worship, Jehovah Jireh, he gave you that car you're driving. It didn't come from your daddy. He gave you that bedroom. He gave you those nice clothes. You would not have it all if it was not for him. I want my children to know the stories, and I still rehearse them to them. I thought about when they were growing up, they all had their own bedroom. But I didn't have my own bedroom until I was a grown man. And if you know what I'm talking about. I want them to know how I struggle and how God provided and how God made a way when there seemed to be no way. Reminds me of an old song. Jesus is the way maker. Jesus is the way maker. One day he made a way for me. When my life was dark and dreary, Jesus came. And he rescued me one day. He made a way for me. Yeah, those old songs there down there. Tell the stories about God's blessing. It's more than just hard work. Now, I'm a worker. I, be, I believe in work. You can work hard, and you can make money. If you really put yourself to it, you can make a lot of money. You're blessed when you got money, but you're so much more blessed when you got God's favor on your money. Hallelujah. Oh, that's why I love seed time and harvest. God's favor is on my life. God's favor is on my money. I want you to look at this right here. This, this is the word of God. Psalms 44 and 3. This sort of sums up what I'm trying to say here. Talking about the nation of Israel. For they got not the land in their possession by their own sword, neither did their own arms save them. But thy right hand and thine arm and the light of thy countenance, because thou hast a favor unto them. God's favor and God's blessings upon the lives of his covenant children. And we've got some stories to tell. I remember when I was still in the world of sin and darkness, I was purchasing manager at the Firestone plant and had a great career there. Had a business of my own making plenty of money. One man told me, he said, Jerry, you're like a man on, a, on a, a wave, just out there riding on the crest of it. He said, everything you touch is blessed. But I tell you what happened to me, that wave that I was riding, one day God just let it send me down. He was calling to me. 
And when I yielded to the voice of the Spirit of God, I see people in here that used to work with me <laughs> at Firestone. God is such a good God. How he's brought us together. And, and, and he uses us wherever he places us. You're his light. And I can remember people at the plant and other places telling me about the love of God. But I already knew. But I had to yield to the flame of the Spirit of God. And when I gave my heart to the Lord, everything in my life has changed for the better. We need some mighty men, some mighty women in the church today. God is looking for some mighty people who will serve them with all their heart. We've got some stories to tell. And I want Brother Elam Johnson to come up and tell his story, whatever he wants to say that the Lord would give him. We got some stories in this place. We got some testimonies. And I'm sure you got some stories to tell. Brother Elam. Yeah, I don't have enough time. I've got a book at home that I've written of stories that God has given me in my life and things he's done. But I'll tell you just a couple. Dad brought me up in church, thank God. He was a very powerful man in, in God. He taught Sunday school for many, many years. And I watched his life as a child. The doctors told him, you got five years to live because you got cancer. This was in his 60s. And that seed of faith that he had got planted into my heart because my dad lived to be 97 years old. He outlived the doctor. God healed him. But that was, as a child, I would lay on the church pew, and all that time that the preachers were preaching, that word was getting into my heart. That seed had been planted there. And I didn't really think about it at that time, but I got to the point that I wanted to preach, God. I wanted to carry your word. So they stood me in a chair behind the pulpit because I was so small they couldn't see me. And I preached God's word in the church, the Law Street Church of God. Well, that had got in me so much. I went home. My dad had a little shed out back. So I went out in that shed, and I found me two five-gallon buckets. I was about seven years old. I turned them upside down, got me a board, and made me a pew. I went through the neighborhood, and I got me four or five and six children to come to my church. And I began to preach to them about Jesus Christ because it was in my heart. I began to tell them about the Antichrist. I began to tell them about the mark of the beast and what would happen to them. And if I don't hush in a hurry, I'm going to start preaching. Praise God. But anyway, you know, that, that service in that church went on for three days. And after that, I lost my congregation. But praise God, I did get to preach. But I want to tell you this last story about the seed time, harvest time. I've got so many I could tell. I worked at a place that we received our paychecks out of Florida. Every Thursday, they would come in. They'd see to it that we get paid on a Friday. And this is with seed time, harvest time. So this particular time, I had a small three children. And you know how you have more days than you have money at the end of the month at that time. And I didn't have nothing but just enough to give them lunch money for the next week. And I had my ties. And that devil needed me all that weekend. You got to have that money. You don't have groceries. You don't have gas money. And I kept rebuking the devil. Well, he worried me to the last minute when I dropped that envelope into that tithe plate, and I never heard another sound from him. <laughs> Monday morning, the mailman walked into where I worked, not to my home, but where I worked, walked up to me and handed me this envelope. He said, is this you? I said, it is. So when he walked out, I opened it up. My paycheck come that Monday morning. So God knew I was going to put that tithe in the offering plate. They arranged my check to be sent out either Thursday or Friday so I would receive it that money. God is a wonderful God. Sow your seed. He's never seen the righteous forsaken or seed out begging bread. Thank God for my father. Hallelujah. That check, by the way, wasn't due to come in until Friday. God got it down Monday. Brother Philip Pearson, he has a story to tell. He grew up in a home. He's about fourth generation, I think. I had no chance as a sinner. I had a praying mom and daddy. And two, pray, two of the best, the best grandmothers that ever walked the face of the earth. 
and a great grandmother. They all Pentecostal holiness, believe it or not. And uh, anyway, a couple of quick ones about each of my grandmothers. When I was about four or five, before TVs were put out, they existed, but we didn't have any. <clears throat> Grandmama, my mother's mother, would invite some of her children. By the way, both of these grandmothers had 12 kids. And both of my, my, my grandmother invited her daughters and some of the husbands for lunch on Sunday. And she was a cook. Both of them were real good cooks. And, uh, and it bothered both of them that I was so skinny. But they would feed me. If I came up by myself, they would offer me something to eat every time. But uh, my mother's mother... She had these headaches that would come on her, and it would make her sick. She'd feel nauseated, and she had to lie down. And she had invited four of the girls for lunch. Well, the girls were in there in the kitchen doing what they could, and Grandma was laying on the couch, and Oral Roberts was on the radio. And I remember him saying, I was about five years old. He said, if you have a prayer request at home, just reach over and lay your hand on the radio for a point of contact. I saw Grandma. She laid her hand on that radio. She came up off of that couch. She screamed a blood curdling scream and started speaking in tongues. My uncle, bless his heart, he won't Pentecostal. It scared him so bad, I heard the front door when the screen door slammed as he was on the way out. He came back about five minutes later, and of course, Grandma was healed immediately, instantly, got up, fixed lunch. And uh, he asked my dad, he said, did she do that very often, Daddy? Daddy said, well, only when the Holy Ghost comes on her. And my other grandmother, she was my fishing partner. She was my dad's mother, and my dad and my, his brother both went, went to Shiloh, and both of them were very slow about getting baptized with the Holy Ghost. And Uncle Tom, which Brother Ray Meeks knows him, uh, he, he was, she was praying with Uncle Tom, and I was praying with him. And I was a teenager by this time. And when the Holy Ghost fell, Grandma had had a stroke. She could barely walk with a cane. One side didn't work. It just enough to keep her from falling. She, she would, could walk. When the Holy Ghost fell on Uncle Tom, it fell on all of us. You would have thought Grandma was Pastor Jerry Nelson's mother. Because she went to dancing around there like you wouldn't believe. Miracles I've seen God do. I could go on, but I just decided I'd give you one for each of my grandmothers, except one more short. My older, my mother's grandmother, she influenced me a lot in Sunday school teaching. And I went up to see her one day. She lived a mile from me. I said, as I come in, she's reading her Bible. I said, Grandma. I said, how many times do you reckon you've read the Bible through? She said, I got no idea. I said, well, why do you keep reading it? She said, I find something new every time. Hallelujah. I tell you, we got some stories to tell. Amen. Sister Charlotte Bynum's going to come and give us a testimony. We're on time here. It's only 10 minutes. Not even quite 10 minutes to 12. But I wanted the people to tell some stories. And the Lord says, tell the children. Now, you've heard testimonies about how two people were influenced. I want you to hear a story about a miracle that took place here in this town and how this sister was the influencing factor. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. Charlotte Bynum. Amen. I'm going to tell the story about when I was living in Maryland, my husband and I, my youngest brother had graduated from college down here. 
So he, him and three other friends were on their way back home to Wilson, North Carolina. So they stopped by our house. So my brother had already said, now I got a sister in there. Now she gonna go with this God, 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 God stuff, but be careful and, 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 and don't say nothing. And so they come in and sit and talk and everything like that. And so of course the Holy Ghost has wisdom. So I just let them be who they were. And then when they got up to get up and say, okay, we're getting ready to go. I stood up with them. And I said, I just got three tracks. I just want to give each of you, each of you one of these tracks. It was three of them. And so they all received it real fast and grabbed it and, and her wasn't got out the front door. So they got in their car and they proceeded home. One of the boys in the mist took his strike and read it when he got home. That shows you that the Holy Spirit has, was already working in that child, but we don't know when the Lord is working in anyone in a particular way. So that strike, that moment, dropped the seed that burst everything wide open for him. He went to their family church, and he accepted the Lord, and he got saved. So my brother called me back and said, guess what? We didn't read our tract, but he read his, and he's the only one crazy down there. And so his parent it floored them because that is their only child. And when he came through, it was like, oh, he crazy. He must have went to a cult or something, or we don't understand what's happening. He's God, God, Jesus, Jesus. I want, I want to do everything. And, and, and he didn't want to do anything else in the circular world per se. I, I, I just want to follow God, Jesus, and all of that. And so he kept moving. And eventually he started uh, uh, like a mentoring series in Wilson, working with kids. And then he went from that level to the next level. Today, he owned that Wilson Academy right there on Tegman Road. And his name is Daryl Woodard. He's the same age as my brother at 58. My brother has three girls. I think he probably had maybe two or one, maybe two girls and a child and a, and a boy. They take their vacation together. They go everywhere because they were close. His daddy and mama were here in Wilson when all of us were gone. Was eight of us and a mom and daddy, so there were 10. All of us had left home but this one child. Mr. Wooder that lived here in Bel Air Forest, his wife is a school teacher, dust and dust and dust. I forgot what his, what his main function was, but I think he was a school teacher or principal or something. But anyway, it, my brother played with his son. And so he got to see that my brother had good manners. My brother uh, tend to his business. He was just what you call a goody goody type child. So he got to know that Tony artists come from the artist family that live in Wilson off of Lane Street. But there's nobody in that home but my mom. By that time, my mother was mentally ill. My daddy, he drinks. So he growing up in the midst of that and not able to get what he need. This wooded boy, daddy, noticed that, took hold of my brother, walked with my brother, let him stay at his house, trained him, took him to get his license, helped him to get car, signed him up in the same college that his son went in. He laid his life down for my brother. And my brother totally went in a different direction himself. He didn't come out with the God God like I did. But his life went straight, never in drugs or anything. God did a great work in his life of being a witness, a witness of what God had done in me. And he saw that. And he realized everybody in my family that accepted the Lord to this day. They are saved based on the seed that God sowed in me and in that family.
all the twin children, twin, my mother, twin sister, children, there's 12 in the family. All of them that had come to the Lord came out to see that God had put in me to open up the way. And it's the same to this day. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. We got some stories to tell, church. I thought about it. the ministers around here. You know, it's much easier to build boys and girls than it is to repair men and women. Let me say that again. It's much easier to build boys and girls than it is to repair men and women. Look at this verse, Isaiah 44 and 3. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your seed and my blessings upon your offspring. See, God is a covenant-keeping God. And God said, if you are thirsty for the things of my kingdom, God has promised, I will bless your seed. You can look for that brother to come and sing with you. He said, I will pour my spirit upon your seed and my blessings upon your offspring. Always remember this. It does matter how you live your life because you are affecting generations to come. God is a generational God. So tell the children. And always remember this. You tell your story by the life that you live. You tell your story by the life that you live. Let us stand. When my will becomes enthroned in your love, when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you, I worship you. I worship you, Lord. I worship you. The reason I live is to worship you the altars are open i worship you if you want to come and kneel at the altar say i worship you lord i worship you thank you for my heritage father the thank you for the gospel is to worship you so love the world you, you gave your only begotten Son. I worship you. Whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I worship you. I worship you. you, Master. I love you, Lord. The reason I live is to worship you. I worship you. I worship you. The reason I live is to worship 